Welcome to the Fifth Trooper Podcast. Hello and welcome back to the Fifth Trooper Podcast. My name is Jay Shalansky. Joining me as always is my co-host, Evan Bullris. Hey, how's it going? And today's a very special podcast. We are actually uh, joined by Kevin Valliere from Imperial Discipline as well. Say hello, Kevin. Hey, thanks for having me back on, Jay Evan. Yes, sir. No problem. And also... We are joined by Derek Fuchs from FFG. Hey, how's it going? Happy to be here. And now it's time for a new segment we like to call the Interrogation Room. It's about time we get some intel. Welcome to the Fifth Troopers Interrogation Room. So, Derek, for the folks at home, why don't you tell them uh, a little bit about what you do for FFG? Yeah, so I am the sculpting manager at Fantasy Flight Games. Uh, essentially, I am the manager for the department that creates all of the plastic uh, miniatures, figures, and components for our games. So now, everyone at home, now you know why he's here. <laughs> 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 it just, we didn't get the mailboy or anybody. We got somebody serious <laughs> for you guys. <laughs> oh, yeah, real serious. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Um, you know, so we've had, uh, we've had both Alex and Luke on before and everybody kind of knows what they do and kind of what a day in the life is for them. But, you know, Derek, what's, what's, what's your day look like? What's the job look like for you day to day? Uh, meetings, just endless, (laughs) endless meetings. Uh, (laughs) no, I mean, uh, mostly, uh, we're constantly working on things, right? We always have sculpts in the hopper that we're working on. Um, and in addition to attending a lot of meetings, I, uh, I'm helping, you know, guide the team and, you know, kind of discuss where we're headed with different things, uh, give them any resources. We, we just kind of work on our sculpts all day and, and kind of have constant feedback loop that, you know, I'm involved with helping provide, um, it kind of begins with, uh, you know, walking into the office and uh, immediately getting bombarded by questions on what we should be doing. <laughs> um, <laughs> and uh, yeah, I mean, like I said, you know, we're constantly working on stuff. So we always got things going on, always uh, new challenges. Uh, every day we come across a new thing that we, you know, we need to address or, uh, you know, things that we want to try out. And then we kind of just put in the work and, and uh, you know, and, and get it going oh, man that's cool well and that's yeah and that's something like we've been trying to point out a lot and is that like hey this is a regular job too for you guys, for you guys like as mm-hmm. cool as this is and as amazing as the miniatures are and working on an ip like star wars it's it's a job too it's like a regular day job yeah absolutely i mean it's 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 awesome but it it, it is definitely a, a job <laughs> No, man, it's uh, it's that passion thing, right? If you like what you do, you don't really work, mm-hmm. kind of, right? Yeah, no, entirely. I mean, I I think that's what a lot of us in this industry, you know, are, are here for because we enjoy games, and we enjoy creating them, we enjoy playing them, and uh, you know, it's cool when we get to work on things like Star Wars, where it, it's a uh, an entire world that we're we're you know most of us are already fans of and here we get to bring it further to life through various forms uh like legion nice is this your first uh miniature kind of position or uh where did you uh where'd you get your start in uh so i joined fantasy flight games as a producer um producer is essentially someone who uh manages a project from from you know the beginning to the end it the person, the producer is responsible for, you know, making sure everything stays on task and on budget, uh, relaying any information and communication that needs to be shared and really just making sure everything goes as smoothly as possible. And, uh, you know, the producer will interact with every department, right? With art, graphic design, the sculpting, uh, production, uh, the dev team. And, uh, and it's kind of that centerpiece for all of that communication and, and, and knowledge on the project. Oh, and uh, and so I, you know, I started as a producer, and uh, you know I worked on quite a few game lines, including uh, you know X Wing, and then Legion. I was producer on on Legion during the core set and the first couple of waves, and 
you know, through a lot of through the work on Legion and kind of the, the constant discussions with sculpting, um, you know, I ended up transitioning over to the manager of the sculpting department. Oh, nice. Mm-hmm. Now, uh, see, so you, you talked about your role as managers. How many people are on your team and, and what sorts of other roles do they, do they fill? Uh, yeah, so I have uh, currently I have five, five uh, people on my team. I have uh, three digital sculptors, uh, Corey DeVore, my lead, uh, and then Adam Martin and Robert Branslig uh, are my other digital sculptors. And they do most of our uh, 3D organic uh, modeling. So, you know, humans, tubers, you know, things like that. Um, I have a plastic designer, Bexley Andrzejczyk, who does most of the uh, hard surface uh, models that we create, the minis. Um, things like almost near, nearly every X-Wing ship, every Armada ship, and uh, things in Legion like the ATRTs, the land speeders, the tanks. Um, you know, uh, so he covers that. And then uh, I have Kevin Van Sloon is my plastics design technician, and he is largely a support role for Bexley, um, also modeling ships and other hard surface uh, miniatures. And then um, he also is, you know, the man behind the 3D printer in our office, which gets a lot of use. Oh, no, yeah, I was about to say the exact same thing. I saw a lot of models back there on the stream. <laughs> yeah, we have, uh, like I said, we, we run that, you know, we're doing stuff every day. We're running our printer nearly every day and just kind of iterating and getting new prints out. And, and uh, yeah, I, if you were to step into our little uh, office department room, uh, you would see uh, shelves of 3D printed miniatures. So I'm going to, I'm going to pop in here with a question since we're talking about 3D printed miniatures, what has been, how has that been for you guys as far as from design to actually, you know, being able to see it in your hand production kind of miniature table ready? How has that, the, the advent of 3D printing changed how FFG approaches uh, approaches stuff like this, like Legion. Oh, it's, it's changed everything. I think, um, the, just the ability to, you know, iterate rapidly, get something in your hands in a day or so and evaluate, you know, how it looked in digital form versus how you are, you know, are seeing it in your hands and then immediately make changes based on that is incredibly important for what we do. You know, uh, yeah, so back if, in the day, yeah, go ahead. That's what I was going to ask you if uh, you could explain yeah, kind of how it was set in the back. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. So back in the day, uh, you know, it was traditionally sculpted uh, clay, um, and uh, you know, we, we would send that out most of the time. We didn't have anybody on staff that could that could do most of the things, and so we'd send that out, and they would send us their you know their sculpt, and it's hand sculpted, and. Uh, you know, if we had any feedback, we'd have to send it back. But most of the time you try to avoid that because it's a very long process. It's hard to communicate uh, that feedback um, when it's a, a physical thing that you're trying to alter. Um, and especially for things like Star Wars, which have to be very accurate. If, if you're not, if you don't have the accuracy to, you know, the, the source material, um, you know, it's very difficult to get a hand sculpted thing uh, in line if it's not quite there. And so, you uh, you know, you would get that and eventually you would, you know, say okay to it and send it off and it would be turned into a resin, but then you would lose uh, that master, right? And so uh, through the through the production process and, and, you know, all you would have left are the resins and you couldn't really make many alterations at that point. And so 3D printing has just been a tremendous uh, tool. Uh, most sculpting is, is shifting to digital, uh, you know, organic sculpting and... Um, and yeah, it, it's been tremendous for us. So do you think, um, could you explain a little bit the difference between sort of how organic sculpting is handled versus more mechanical sculpting? And for our listeners, what I mean is more human-based or humanoid-based figures and cloth and ground and that sort of thing versus vehicles. Yeah, well, I mean, I think that the biggest difference is, well, besides the software, you know, vehicle and things use a little bit more CAD-based, uh, you know, more engineering tools because they're, you know, a lot of just geometric shapes um, and angles and degrees and measurements. 
Whereas organic sculpting is as its name, you know, you are essentially digitally sculpting clay um, and, and are able to kind of introduce curves and all sorts of things that, that you would take forever to do in, in any other uh, more CAD based software. And so, uh, you know, one of the big things we use for organic, you know, ZBrush and, uh, and yeah, and, uh, you know, it just is a tremendous tool for exactly that purpose. And, um, now, do you, you know, it just allows you to get a lot of that stuff. Yeah. Now, are you guys on, uh, are you using Maya 3ds Max to, can you divulge that? Tips. Uh, <laughs> we, we, your secret. Tell me all your <laughs> secrets. Yeah, we mainly use ZBrush. I mean, if yeah. you look to any of our job postings for the position, it'll list the, uh, you know, the software that we're looking for experience in, and, and ZBrush is one of them. And SolidWorks on the other end uh, is another yeah. one that we use a lot. So, uh, yeah. Yeah, cool. And so, you know, for just for some listeners who who may not know, so like SolidWorks, like like you said, is more like if I want to design a computer or if I want to design something very mechanical that we take advantage of every day, telephone or, you know, something like Mm -hmm. that, you would use a program more like SolidWorks, but if I wanted to design like uh, something for like an animation or a video game or something like that, a software similar to Z- ZBrush is what, what we would use. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, Derek, SolidWorks. I'm sure, yeah, just, I'm sure that given the uh, sphere you work in, that there are plenty of demands on your job, but it's also clear that like, even just in the way that you talk about these, these small sort of tasky things you've got a lot of passion for it so what what for you is the most rewarding part of of managing this process i really i really like what you know we do i think that uh you know i think about this all the time actually and and one of the most rewarding things to me is it doesn't matter what game it is like whenever i go into a game store or our you know our, our our game center uh or I'm just out at different conventions and I, I see people down, friends, families, you know, whomever playing games together, uh, sitting there, you know, together, interacting, socializing. It doesn't matter what they're playing. That's what excites me. That's what's rewarding to me because it's, it's a shared passion, you know, uh, across all of us gamers and, um, you know, that, that and, and even more so than when it is our products and I get to see, you know, all of you playing Legion or, uh, anything else that we do, it's just, it's incredibly cool. Um, and that's what, you know, that's what I live for. It's good to hear. I no, sure. That. That's awesome. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, wholesome. um, wholesome so you, like you just said, and, and, you know, most of the guys that we meet from FFG, you know, we always talk to them about gaming. Uh, so do you play Star Wars Legion? <laughs> Not as much as I would like to. Uh, I actually, over the holiday weekend, I was just home and uh, you know, I've been sending my sending my dad and brother, you know, product after product. I'm like, here, you know, here's this, here's Stormtroopers, here's, you know, here's your Rebel Commandos. And, uh, and he had yet to put together anything. And so I, I had been assembling a bunch on my own here, but I haven't actually played outside of work. And uh, I was like, you know what, I'm just going to bring all this home. Uh, and, and, and do a trade. I'll give them all the assembled things. I'll take all the unassembled stuff. And, uh, <laughs> and so, you know, we sat down, we actually played through a couple of games and, and had a lot of fun. So I haven't played as much as I'd like to, um, especially in my personal time, but certainly during the early development of Legion and the, you know, the alpha and beta stages, I was, you know, I was right there with Alex and we were cranking through, uh, this is before even Luke was, was with us and we were cranking through a lot of play tests and, and, you know, that's where I found found most of my involvement. I haven't been in wargaming too long, but I'm not. I don't play as much as I want to, and I have a bunch of unassembled minis. Sounds pretty much like the wargamers lament. So, I think mm-hmm. you're in good company there. <laughs> um. So I know we we kind of covered it a little bit, but if you could maybe just high level walk us through the process of from a miniature standpoint, how a new unit, you know, actually gets designed and made uh, for you guys. Sure. Yeah. Um, 
well, once the once the uh, devs and everything is cleared on on exactly what we're going to do, um, the release first starts with gathering uh, as much reference as possible. Um, a lot of that reference comes directly from Lucasfilm. We'll you know we'll request it, uh, but also a lot of it comes from uh, you know screenshots of the films or the TV shows, uh, anything that's that's a real source material that we can use. Um, and, and, it, and it starts there and kind of studying that. Uh, and then what we'll do is we'll take that reference and generally for say a trooper unit, um, we'll start getting a, you know, we'll start getting a T pose in place and we'll start building all of the assets, all of the, the weapons and the armor and, and, you know, start nailing down the details. Um, and, 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 you know, during that time, we'll also be thinking about the poses and we'll start sketching out, you know, where we're going to take that, uh, wh- what this unit's going to look like, um, how are they going to, you know, try to match it to their depictions and, and you know, the films or the shows or games. And, um, and, you know, we'll start mapping out what, you know, potentially their poses will look like as we're, you know, finalizing and, and wrapping up the T-pos. And then uh, there's a lot of internal uh, processes for feedback. You know, we have a lot in the department. Um, most of my team is very collaborative where we, we believe in, in collaboration and just everyone kind of getting, uh, getting their hands on it and trading it back and forth if we need to. And so there's a lot of discussion that happens inside the room where, you know, we'll, we'll throw things up on the board and uh, or on somebody's screen and we'll, we'll kind of have a little, a little discussion on, on whatever needs to be addressed. But um and then we have some official, more internal, with the creative directors of the of the studio, uh, you know, approvals processes essentially, um, where we'll do some back and forth, and and so we just continue to in, iterate internally until we get it into a place that you know we feel very strongly about, um, you know, wh- where it's at. And then uh, sometimes this includes uh, discussions with Lucasfilm, um, depending on on what it is, uh, and the level of discussion varies. Um, and then we'll uh, we'll send it off to to Lucasfilm for approval, and we'll get their thoughts, and then another you know series of iterations if needed, and uh, and yeah, and then eventually you know once everything's good to go, uh, we do a little pre production, we prepare it, send off to the, to our uh, production f- facilities, and uh, which is a whole lot of work in its own right. Uh, I could talk about that for days. Yeah, sure. <laughs> um, <laughs> and uh, I'm sure we might get to that. Uh, and then, yeah, and eventually uh, we start getting samples and we review the samples, make sure that there are no major flaws or errors or, or you know, anything that needs to be corrected. And, uh, you know, eventually, after a long while, it'll, uh, it gets made and, and then in everyone's hands. Yeah. So, I mean, you really explain that well, but all I heard was that you guys get paid to watch Star Wars stuff, right? Is that what I? Yeah, heard? yeah, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, it must I, be real. We watch Star Wars stuff, anyways. Anyways, right, right. It's just a bonus. <laughs> yeah, Derek, do you guys ever get tempted to cheat and just go look at the five hundred first and Rebel Legion websites for details? Uh, yeah, I think the temptation's there, but we never do. Um, I, I, I got a chance to talk to Brendan uh, over Worlds Weekend, and uh, you know, it was the first time I really learned a little bit more about what the 501st does and how painfully, you know, how much they pay attention to the detail and try to really accurately depict, uh, you know, the different pieces that they're putting together. But, um, you know, for our purposes, we want to stick to the source reference and materials and, and just, you know, and do our own thing there. Yeah. And so it's, I think it's interesting for everybody out there to hear, you know, besides, just coming up with how the units are going to function, you know, there's this whole other machine right behind it to like get those units mm. for the table and get, and get them ready. And, mm-hmm. and like, you were even talking about like getting production ready, right? Like that's like you said, like, yeah, we could probably talk about that all day long. Cause you know, your, your first samples and then send it, you know, making, cause you were talking about all the changes that you have to make just internally between FFG mm-hmm. and Lucasfilm, but that that's not even including once you go to production, like there may be things that need to be adjusted as well too, because there's 
something that, you know, there's a different way of packing it or a different way of putting it together that needs to happen. Yeah, well, I mean, I think uh, injection molded injection molded plastic is, uh, you know, it's an entire process and in, in, uh, in its own right. And in order for us to do it correctly, it means we have to pay attention to parting and, we, you know, draft angles and, uh, you know, we don't want to lose detail. If something's not oriented correctly, uh, that means we have to split it into additional parts and maybe that's too fiddly or too much for, for the end user to put together. And so those are all sorts of things that we kind of consider as we, we go through it. Uh, and, you know, even earlier before that, I didn't even, I didn't really hit on it, but, um, <laughs> you know, working with Alex and Luke and, and what they want to do mechanically, um, you know, we try at Fantasy Flight to kind of, uh, to have all the pieces of the cake that we want. And so uh, it, it, what I mean by that is uh, if the devs, if Alex and Luke, they really want, you know, these mechanics to happen and, and we want to represent that in the sculpt, uh, you know, we work together to figure out how to make that work. Um, we don't, you know, just sculpt something and then they go ahead and, uh, you know, make it based on what we've done. We we, we work together, we discuss the plan, we, we discuss what, uh, you know, what the unit's going to do and how we want to depict it. Um, but yeah, as far as the, the production side of things, uh, like I said, there's a lot to consider there and, and sometimes that changes the direction, uh, as we've gotten better and, and have a better understanding of, of, you know, how to, uh, tackle those, those, uh, problems a little bit more head on, uh, we can kind of guess, or, uh, what should I say? Um, we can better predict what we need to do, uh, prior to actually sending it out. Yep. And mm -hmm. so we see, you know, less changes as a result, but uh, it's certainly considerations there. So, you know, over the last over the last year or so, or maybe even more recently, with the, I mean, you've been working on them for longer than we've had them. So, but what we've seen in the more recent used units are these more um, dynamic poses. Mm -hmm. So, I, you know, I don't know if you want to talk about that and where that shift came. Into well, what, what do you like about them? That they look like they're actually uh, doing something on the battlefield versus just standing <laughs> there. That Pathfinder leader, uh, I love actually. Oh, the one with the arm uh, As much as I love and hate Pathfinders, yeah, they're great. Yeah, I think I, even even going to to Jay's comment, even the the standing poses have gotten so good. I, I'm not sure there's a model I like more for its simplicity than Krennic. Because you know, I think Boss mm, Boss got this a little true. bit too. Krennic makes people look like way better painters than they actually are, and I'm not sure how he all did it. Yeah. But like, <laughs> I, I haven't seen a bad Krennic yet, and I think that is, like that is that is not a testament to that's painters fair. and Legion. There are plenty of great ones out there, but like that, yeah. I think that's really a testament to the model making. Because I yeah, every single Krennic that I've seen looks good. That facial sculpt is great. The cape is great. Um, yeah. Yeah, well, I, thank that's you. not like a leading question for you. I just felt like I needed to say that. Chronic Falls. Well, no, thank you. That, that's uh, that's great to hear. Honestly, um, I, I you know there's a lot of really good things in the initial waves in the, in the core set, uh, and and for us it was just a matter of building upon what we found uh, was working really well, um, and learning from that. You know, we got a lot of community feedback. Uh, we have a lot of internal thoughts and, and feedback, and then it's just a matter of looking at. Uh, you know, our process and building upon our successes. I mean, um, you look at at things like, uh, it, let's see, the uh, the Tauntauns, for example. We don't have anything like that. Uh, and they're a really cool challenge because, um, you know, as we've been focused more and more on trying to get uh, the characteristics of, of these units and these characters to into the sculpt, Form. The Tauntauns are another example of that where, you know, how do we capture Tauntauns in a way that isn't just, you know, either them split open or uh, <laughs> <laughs> or standing there, um, you know, roaring out over the top and, uh, and and just kind of paying attention to those elements. And I think generally as a as a process um, for us, it's just been, you know, we get it to a point. We get a sculpt to a point where we're like, this is good. You know, all the details there, the accuracy is there. It feels like the character of the unit. It's, it's you know, been considered for, uh, you know, the depictions we see and, and it's, it's where we want it. And then we stop and go, 
how can we push this just a little bit further? And I think that's been a little bit of a mentality shift uh, where, you know, we're trying to to ask that question a little bit more often and, and really take uh, our scalps just that extra notch. Yeah, I think y'all, y'all have absolutely achieved that. Now, I mean, looking back, is there, I guess, what, what was the most challenging model for you to produce with that mindset? Hmm. You, you said tauntauns were, you know, you didn't want to just do like the sort of like funny split open or just like the standing up roaring, but you know, what, what, what model, I guess, proved a roadblock for you? Well, I mean, you know, the, the tauntauns and the do back were both challenging in the fact that, you know, there's, they, they were, they haven't been depicted that many, uh, they haven't been put it, ah, depicted that often. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and so, you know, what we really had were the original films and a couple of the show interpretations and, and, uh, you know, if you look at like the do backs, anyone who studies them a little closely will see that there's been a variety of depictions of them. And so kind of combining all of these elements together and, and figuring out what, what is kind of the best and working with LFL to nail down some of those, those, uh, you know, questions, um, and really get it into a place that we were, we were happy with was, was certainly challenging. Although I think more to recent developments, like with the plastic changes and just what we're doing, the B1s and the Dredicas that you guys just saw on the screen, mm-hmm. uh, they they were really our first stab at, at uh, you know, how do we how do we take something that is this skeletal almost in nature and and make it work, um, and uh, you know, and not be too fiddly or too messy, and you know, th- those were pretty difficult to nail down, especially because we were learning a lot and we're, you know, transitioning to the new processes. Um, but I'm really happy with how those turned out. I mean, I, I think if you look at them on the table, uh, they look awesome. The Jordicas are really cool. They, you know, alternating, uh, between the rolly form and the standing form. And, uh, the B ones have a lot of, uh, you know, in their arms, especially there's a lot of posability. I think players will find though they're going to be able to assemble them. Uh, and, and some different configurations, and so yeah, those were those are definitely some of the more recent challenges that have been that have been fun to do, though. Yeah. So while, while we've got you talking about the uh, the Confederacy, um, can you tell us a little bit about what sort of what logistical challenges led you to switching to sprues, and maybe what players who haven't used sprues in the past can expect from those models? Yeah, well, I mean, I, I think it's important to, to note that, you know, the one of the biggest reasons for wanting, you know, us wanting to switch to uh, uh, what we call frames and um, and kind of the harder plastic is uh, is really just one of the to get more detail. Um, I, I think hard plastic, uh, the plastic that we'll be using is allows us to have a little bit more crisper edges, uh, smaller minimums. We can get a little bit more detail out of things and, and not have them, uh, you know, like I love the Royal Guards. I think they're awesome, but uh, I don't know if any of you open a box where you have some droopy or bendy uh, electro staves or their uh, shock prods, but, um, you know, that, that's one of the things that the, the softer material does is unfortunately it bends and warps and, um you know, and this new plastic will, will avoid that. And so the frames are almost a necessity for switching to harder plastic because uh, the plastic is, um, you know, it, because it can't flex as much, it will break if you try to snap it. And so, uh, you know, the frames beyond being uh, kind of an industry standard for, you know, minis games is also a way to protect them and to allow the end user to, uh, you know, to, to feel comfortable in what they get. And not all have a million pieces floating in the box. Yeah. So now, right now, we've got um, you know mold lines and some of the minis that, in reality, haven't been particularly cumbersome to work around. Uh, did y'all design? Maybe this is a bigger question than I'm asking. How much thought goes into design of the placement of the minis on the frames? Are y'all actively looking to try and avoid, you know? Um, the sprues connecting in weird places. Is that just something you kind of just have to deal with and hope that it works out? Or is that something you can control? Yeah. Well, I mean, I think uh, we we try to be, or we're trying to be very intentional uh, with our parting. Um, 
especially I, I think now we have more control, uh, but we're still learning, you know, as we do it. And um, I think we're trying to be very intentional with our parting and kind of uh, see where we can hide seams along, you know, where an armor piece maybe connects at the, at the shoulder or something that looks natural uh, for a seam. Um, you know, uh, little things like that. We are, you know, as considerate as we can be with that and, and do what we can to not have some egregious seam, you know, going right over the top of a guy that, that totally obscures some detail that we want to capture. Mm-hmm. So back in March, I think you had talked about, I think there was a tweet I saw that said that, you know, what we had seen at Adepticon uh, with the with the advent of the sprues and the harder plastic was just the first steps from you transitioning over. So is the goal to be to completely do this for all models or is it going to be sort of a depending on the unit model type, you would choose that way to, to produce them? Uh, no, the goal is, is to, to get everything going this way. Um, you know, as everyone knows, or, uh, the course at the phase one troopers and Obi-Wan and the riders of the bark speeder are not, uh, you know, hard plastic. They're the, the way that we've always seen them. Um, but the B1s, uh, and the, uh, Jordicas are on and Grievous are on, on, uh, on frames and, uh, and yeah, so, you know, that was just the nature of where we were at and, and, and what we could do at the time with, uh, you know, what, what we knew. And, and now that we, we've been able to cross that bridge and, and we're, we're transitioning everything over as, as much as we can. Yeah, it's uh, it's really exciting. I, I I hadn't had as much exposure to the sprues beforehand. You know, I I really liked the ease of the ease of use that especially the early Legion models had of just like slotting stuff in. Even as as I was talking to my friends who were doing other war games, even that was just a huge selling point on Legion. But I am really excited to see um, what comes next and what y'all are going to be able to do. And I definitely think that you know. The Clone Wars set feels like a ripe time um, to do that. When you were when you were tasked with doing the alt sculpt Vader, uh, was that something your team was kind of excited about? Yeah, I mean, I, it actually came together pretty quickly. Um, first of all, the just the opportunity to kind of uh, to take Vader on again, and, and and you know we knew that it was going to be in resin, and so that meant that we could get a little bit more detail and refinement into him. Um, to that the material would allow us to, to kind of demonstrate or show. And, uh, you know, we went back and forth a lot on, we knew we wanted it to be something that, uh, that stood out that had a little bit more going on than just Vader, uh, in a pose. And so, uh, the idea of some sort of basing element, uh, really came on and everybody was kind of excited by that and we tried a couple of different ideas i think at one point we had uh kind of him in, in a bit of a sandish environment with uh like force bending some metal construction objects around and uh you know it was a little bit too much for for the purposes of the of the <laughs> you know what it ended up being um but it was fun to explore those options and uh you know i, I think one of the things that we really liked was uh, hopefully everyone feels this way about the the base, but uh, we thought it was a really cool idea to have a base like the rocks that are kind of breaking up, up and towards him or you know, up and away a little bit. Um, and just trying to trying to sell that sense of, uh, you know, of him using the force and it's affecting the, the, the ground around him. And uh, so that was really fun trying to, you know, figure out how we could create that uh for better or worse an illusion um with the pieces now i didn't you know i didn't know there's gonna be a lot of tiny little rocks at the end but uh, that's, <laughs> that's what ended up working and, and i think that uh, i think it looks fantastic i mean i'm really happy with how the elevator turned out no yeah the uh the extra basing is pretty interesting right as a like display piece i think it's awesome as a competitive piece uh maybe uh you know, just it's a weird like how that works for the game, but uh, either way, man, it looks awesome though. That yeah, it's, you know, it became quite quite desirable to try to get one of those. 
Yeah, well, and, and, you know, we thought it was important that regardless of the basing element there that, you know, you could assemble him with just the base and 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 still, you know, have your cool uh, Celebration Vader, um, but he didn't need to have the, the, the rock element there if you don't want to. Yeah, uh, it looks cool either way, right? Yeah, exactly. Speaking of alt sculpts, uh, you know, we, we, we jumped pretty quickly from current stuff to future stuff with the Clone Wars. But I think one thing we, we skipped over was uh, the introduction of the multiple poses for units. You know, we, mm. we've, we've mm-hmm. all just recently got our hands on Sabine and Bosk. There's some really gorgeous, you know, I was just looking at <laughs> like a, a, a double gun version of Bosk today that I, that I thought was really funny. <laughs> um, can you, can you tell us a little bit about what, prompted the evolution from you know just sort of the single static mini to the choice uh, and you know how your team has adjusted to that and what challenges it presents you well you know i think a lot of it has to do with you know what uh what our fans expect you know a lot of the feedback was you know while the the minis like you mentioned earlier in the uh you know in the first up until this point have been really uh you know, like kind of push fit, easy to assemble. They didn't provide a whole lot of options. Um, you had to kind of go and do a little bit of work to, if you wanted to change up or mix and match some poses or, you know, weapons or arms. And, uh, and I think it's been something that's been on our mind for a while to try to, to try to accomplish and, and uh, get into uh, our different uh, miniatures. And, um, you know, Bosk and Sabine are, are really, I think the first examples of that to a degree. Um, and, uh, you know, and, and also where it makes sense, right? With the um, Sabine and, and Bosk, you know, I mentioned how we talk with the devs about what kind of mechanics and things they want to do. Well, they knew they wanted to have Sabine with a dark saber, and we wanted to depict that some way. And so, uh, you know, providing an alternate arm as an option was, was a great way to, to help do that. And, uh, you know, when you talk about, well, Sabine, you know, she, she's such a character in the show and she has very distinct look both with the helmet and without and how could we not include both of those as well um and just provide those options and and really uh you know everyone was really happy with that internally and i think uh you know we're starting to see the results of that uh it's, it's been amazing looking at everyone's painted sabines and bosks and uh and seeing the different you know configurations that they go with and and it's interesting to see who chooses what um but they look great. And so we wanted to continue applying that to, uh, you know, as much of the future stuff as possible and, uh, and just provide uh, our players with this, this, you know, more customizability um, wherever we can. Yeah. Now I, I do want to follow the um, posability thread a little bit further in a minute, but before I do that, one thing, I'm not sure if it was intentional, if this is something that y'all think about when sculpting minis, but as I've been looking at the Boston Sabine release together and, you know, looking, having my hands on both now, um, it feels like Bosk lends itself. I think Bosk is sort of a little bit easier overall to paint, but allows for still a great range of detail. Sabine is in much the same way that I love Boba Fett, almost a blank canvas. You know, I, I wrote an article about all the different like patterns and aesthetics that go into Sabine's armor. Mm-hmm. Um, do y'all, yeah, and I think like, you know, there, there's sort of a threshold for like, you can just paint it black and it's probably going to look great anyways, or you could go for that checkerboard pattern and really try and sell this authentic Sabine look. Um, what sort of consideration do y'all to give to painter skill level um, when you're making minis? Like, are there some techniques or some design methods that are off limits to you just because you want to make sure that it is an accessible mini? Um, I think that uh, the character or the unit or whatever we're depicting comes first. And so making sure that all of the pieces that are supposed to be there are there, you know, the jacket and the helmet and, you know, whatever we're, we're trying to capture is, you know, accurate and to the source material and, 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 and reads at, you know, from a table distance uh, as what, you know, we're trying to depict. And so I think that comes first and honestly supersedes or over, uh, you know, overwrites any other considerations. Um, and, uh, and especially when it comes to painting now, I, I think when I think about what looks and works really well on, a, on a mini like Bosk, right. He's got great, uh, 
he's got these great like areas of of large folds, you know, with his jumpsuit, mm-hmm. and 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 but then he's got this this detailed scaling that really captures a lot of um, a lot of the you know the paint and the washes, and so uh, you know it's important that that in those areas we make sure that we push them so that paint does catch, and we know that we don't we we're like well if you prime this and throw a couple layers on we don't want that detail getting covered up or feeling like it's now smooth. And so, you know, we'll, we'll go in and push it further and further until, you know, we're happy with it and know that, you know, it's going to look great in the end once it's all painted up. And I think, uh, you know, like I said, Bosk is, you know, he's been a poster child lately. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think in the same way that I was talking about how, I, you know, I, I don't think I've seen a single bad Chronic Mini. I feel very similarly about Bosk, where those scales catch highlights and shadows mm-hmm. so well that it really elevates people's painting. I think that's, yeah, you also absolutely be commended for how you did that, because I, I can't imagine that finding that balance was easy. Um, but I, I did say I wanted to follow that posability thread, and we did get to finally see on the stream, um, both with the Fifth Trooper over the weekend and today on the live stream uh the very very cool swinging sidecar <laughs> on the bark speeder so not only do we have like the, the separate static poses we've got multiple poses in game um how, how cool is that for design oh you know it, it's something you see in the show and, and that they do and we're like well we have to right we're not going to just lock this in and uh and so uh yeah i mean it it it's it's uh it has a mechanical tie-in right and i think that's important anything we do should have uh a mechanical tie-in and and so for it to be able to swing around but that whole sidecar is optional too right uh you don't have to take it you don't have to assemble it with the sidecar you can do just a single bike without them um and and you know that's also an option just in that you know the uh i don't know how much of uh, was spoiled for the for the bark, but you know there's also a couple of upgrade options that are then represented by sculpt pieces um, for the sidecar in particular, uh, and, and you know and some additional options there. Um, and then I don't know if uh, you all saw the phase one clones uh, in a little bit more detail, but one of the things that we did with those in the core set. Um, was uh, really tried to get cylindrical plugs for all of those things. So you know how traditionally there's been kind of uh, specific fits to a lot of the you know the arm or head connections. And uh, one of the things we knew as we continue to talk about well, how can we provide more posability or options was to create uh, you know cylindrical plugs that allow for a little bit of rotation in the arms, you know, up or down or the head left mm-hmm. or right. And 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 because they're pretty much the same size you can actually swap those arms out with minimal effort and and put you know uh, a long rifle on somebody that you know didn't have that before um and you know it, just that little bit of motion where you can turn that head left or right and raise that arm up down you know up or down like he's you know a trooper's looking down the sights or kind of more at the ready uh, i think is going to really be uh it's going to look great i think people are going to really love that and be able to kind of mix and match and customize. And I think we're going to see a lot of clone uh, phase one troopers that are not like other people's like uh, people will assemble them in different ways. And that's really exciting to me. Yeah. I think that's, I think that's super exciting for the community too, right? Is that because right now we're, we're relegated to painting to make ourselves unique and so be able to also add on to that a little bit of posing as well. That's going to be, I think that's going to be huge for, for us as mm-hmm. a hobby enthusiasts. So that's, that is very cool. But, uh, all right. Well, Derek, thank you so much for joining us today. We really appreciate it. Um, Absolutely. Thank you for having yeah, me. And uh, you guys have been, yeah, thanks for coming on. Yeah. You guys have been doing a wonderful job. So thank you so much for, for kicking butt on these models. Thank you. Yeah, hopefully I can uh, be back on here in the future. Oh, heck yeah. Talk about new stuff. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so that was Derek Fuchs from FFG. Uh, I don't know. I, I thought that was uh, an extremely interesting conversation. I don't know what you guys thought. Yeah, it's 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 interesting to see what they're thinking about and, and, and what's coming down the pike because uh, – yeah, I mean, like it's we, that selling point of just like the so easy minis and the moving to the sprues. You know, I know that some people 
had concerns about that, but I think it's going to lead to some really cool stuff. It's just one of those avenues when you're in a, a miniature war game that you don't really think about. Like most of the time we're thinking about what announcement Luke or Ox is going to say, because they actually affect the gameplay. Right. Uh, but you don't always think about the guys who are actually, you know, uh, going crunch time, trying to make the death troopers look like death troopers before they get sent out for the release date, you know? Yeah. And I, I mean, you know, I, I, I'm going to be honest a little bit. I, I'm a little worried about the going to the, the sprues or the racks there. Um, I think it's going to be good from a hobby aspect. So, so this is the hobbyist in me, like the old school. I think it's great. Uh, but I think that you may suffer a little bit with, I mean, Kevin, you know, you, you were newer to the hobby when you picked up star Wars Legion, if they were all on racks, like, how would you how would you have dealt with that yeah i mean i don't know i I remember as a kid trying to put together god i don't even know what the name is there's some warhammer army that looks like zerg from starcraft and i tried to put those tyranids yes tyranids i tried to put those things together and and stopped after one because i glue all over my finger (laughs) so that's (laughs) like that's what i think of yeah at least what i used to think of when i think of sprues now i've you know i've done a couple of the lord of the rings minis they have sprues I do the Gundam models. They're on sprues. I'm a lot more comfortable with what that entails now, and I have the tools to do it. Um, I feel reasonably confident that they're going to do it in such a way that it is still accessible. But I don't know. I, I think maybe it's just part of an, an, inevit- an inevitable growth of the game. Like, if we want to see Legion get better and do more things, we're going to have to lose some of that accessibility, you know? I, yeah, I don't disagree at all. And I think it'll probably be up to us, you know, like, for instance, telling people for the, you know, for the droids, don't use super glue, use plastic glue. Yeah. Uh, it's going to be easier for you. So it'll be up to guys like us to just make yeah. sure some of the newer people to the hobby aspect, you know, know how to how to work this stuff. So look out for that Imperial discipline dot blog article. What sprue <laughs> means for you coming, coming to your computer early August. <laughs> <laughs> this stuff writes itself. <laughs> and I'm I'm going to be honest with all of you out there. You shouldn't wait till August to go to Kevin's website. You should go oh, now. It's, an ama- it's amazing, especially if you're newer to the hobby and stuff. Even if you're old to the hobby, screw it. You should go to Kevin's blog and you should give him tons of hits because he deserves it and he does amazing work. So Thanks, man. Thanks, man. I really appreciate that. Yeah, no problem. So I thought it'd be fun. Uh, we got a few minutes here. To do like a little debrief of the Northeast Open. So yeah, man. we had our big tournament uh, this past weekend, Saturday and Sunday. Uh, if you didn't catch it, we live streamed both days on our YouTube channel. And, you know, I thought it'd be fun for Kev here to tell us how it was from a player aspect because Kevin came up and, uh, and, and played in the tournament. So what'd you think, man? I mean, listen, this is going to sound like I'm just blowing smoke up your ass because I'm on your podcast, but like genuinely, it was an amazing experience. And I don't think there's anyone who went that would say anything other other than the fact that it was just so good all around from, you know, the the, the level of uh, terrain was exceptional. For, I mean, like the, the Cook family board's uh, stand out with some that were really amazing. That Hoff one that ended up on the stream day two was incredible. Uh, I also, I don't, I don't think it ended up on stream at all, but maybe you all saw pictures of the, the piece of, uh, or the terrain table that was done with kids toys. I absolutely loved that idea. Um, that was our boy Evan's idea. Oh, that was you, Evan. I don't think I realized that. Yeah, that was mine. That was my, uh, contribution to the, my only contribution really to the to the table. That was literally the first table that I took a photo of when I got there. I saw that and I was like, this is the best thing I've ever seen. <laughs> so sending it to my girlfriend and sending it to the Discord. Um yeah, I mean I think like from from the quality of the competition, just to the friendliness of everyone there, um, it, it was a great event. I think Salt City Comic Con was fun too. It was sort of the perfect level of event to be surrounding. It was also so nice to have as much space as we did. Who knows if that's gonna be a thing you can finagle next year. Um, uh, yeah. So actually, funny thing is, I, I, you know, we did our deep. I did my debrief with the guy who runs Salt City, and uh, yeah, no, we're good for next year for the same oh, amount so of space. Yeah, I, mean, I used to play in like New York City, or even like Magic the Gathering and Key Forge. Like you are just butt to butt with everyone around you. So yeah. that that is a real, real nice change of pace. 
in terms of space available to me. Um, the, well, sometimes the, they put the tables end to end too, right? So like yeah. if you wanted to pop you over to the other side. So- yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. But I mean, yeah, tables, competition, uh, the, um, the prize support that y'all gave out, um, I, yeah, I, I can't say enough good things about it. And I hope, I hope y'all feel good about it because certainly I, I had a fantastic time and it is, it's not even a question that if I am remotely free, I'll be there next year. Well, I'm going to go ahead and put, press pay now on this PayPal account. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, no. So what do you, um, this was your first kind of major tournament too, right, Kevin? For any game, uh, at any point, yeah. I mean, we, we do small stuff around here in New York City. I really, I really like the guys that we play with, but it, it's small, you know, just out of necessity in New York City. So for any any sort of board or war game, yeah, this is my first one. So if you could kind of talk to, like, your mindset going in, because I think there's a lot of people that, especially that listen to this podcast, that have never been to a tournament, and maybe they have a little trepidation or a little, you know – something holding them back from going. So maybe mm-hmm. kind of, if you want to talk through maybe your emotional experience a little bit from before, like thinking about going to then attending and seeing the great community and everything. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't think it's, it, it, it's not a big secret that I'm a pretty anxious person. And especially when it comes to big competitive things that, that gives me the heebie jeebies. Um, but I think there are just certain types of events that understand the nature of a competitive game like this and you can either play into that or you do what you can to sort of have a quality event while also ameliorating that and i feel like you guys were the latter um you know i I was even knowing that you know i'm in the benefit of a lot of the people at northeast open i've talked to a ton on discord i knew you guys i knew brendan and kyle and all these other guys who are awesome and were there um but even then you know i was still feeling pretty nervous wasn't really talking to anybody when i first got there but um at a certain point i don't know i think one of my favorite things about legion is that it is a star wars property and like no matter what's going on you've got this one thing in common with pretty much everyone everyone there where you can just talk shop about star wars all day even if you're not a great painter or you're not a great player and certainly i'm not a great player um it is a great bonding experience and i'm definitely an introvert and so normally i find myself after stuff like that wanting to just crawl into a hole and not talk to anybody for forever <laughs> but like it wasn't even a question after day one i was like yes i absolutely want to go out to dinner and hang out with these people and have a couple drinks um and I, it was great and i had zero regrets about going out too and i was uh, all the more excited to return the next day and hang out um yeah i, I think y'all hit a really great divide between there was some really high level of competition and congrats again to to sploosh and to to run around bush vex who you know, i got to do table reporting for that championship game and it was a blast to watch that final game um there was some really high level competition but at no point did i feel the pressure of i have to perform really well here or anything like that uh it was just a great time all around i, I love too y'all did the jankiest award the guy who won the jankiest award was my very first competition christian i don't know if you listen to this podcast um he had three core and five vehicles three atrts <laughs> an air yeah. speeder and a land speeder and he went up against my 10 activation impact heavy imperialist and i felt bad for him because like that's the worst matchup you could have drawn yeah um but he had such a good time uh, and i'm so glad that he won the jank awards yeah yeah I, I, dude i love that guy he he was so like excited about bringing jank and yeah. he was like, oh, I hope, like, before we, we did our, our voting and everything, he's like, I hope I win. I brought five vehicles. <laughs> and in my head, I'm just like, yeah, you won. <laughs> like, you know yeah. what I mean? Uh, but, yeah, he had a great time. He was telling me afterwards. And so that was exciting to, to see that. But I guess, you know, I didn't. I didn't bring it up because I wanted you to like tell everybody how great of a job we did. The reason I was bringing it up is because I think – from a community standpoint in general, we have an opportunity to, I I wanted to prove that we could do both. Like what you said, where we could have a nice casual event for, you know, you weren't the only first person uh, for, for a tournament. There were, Mm -hmm. there was a number of players there that this was their first tournament. Some of them, it was only like their fourth game ever. And, and so I think there's an opportunity where we can still be 
uber competitive. I mean, we had two worlds attendees there, plus, you know, plus some of the best people on Discord on the TTS. And so there's an opportunity where you can have both that they, I don't think they're mutually exclusive. I, th- I think you can do both at the same time. And this yeah. was kind of my like test bed, you know, to, to see if, if that was, if that was possible. Mm-hmm. Now, Evan, you were, you were on stream pretty much the whole time, weren't you? Yeah, I was. What was I was it? working, the, I was managing the stream. What did you enjoy most about your time at the Northeast Open? Oh gosh. Um, Besides getting uh, to sleep afterwards. Yeah, uh, <laughs> you know, it was just cool to see a lot of my friends um, getting to see them in one place where uh, it was in the east. And normally when I have to go to a Legion events like right, like Jane knows, we got to travel at least two hours mm-hmm. like one way. Uh, so it's cool to have everyone in the area um, hanging out, having a good time. Uh, the awards were fun. Uh you know, it was overall, man, like it's it was a great fan event. Like that's kind of why uh kind of what we did it for, right? Like it was casual, it was competitive. Uh those two can go hand in hand. And uh, everyone left and no one looked upset. You know, yeah. that's not normally a uh uh a tournament, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So it was cool to see everyone like leave happy for a change. Yeah. Yeah, well I think, you know, for anybody out there listening uh that wants to organize a tournament I think the part of it is, is it's got to be, it, you can't just make it about the competition. You got to make it about like, it's like part of the show. Like, and as for an example, like we had the Mandalorian, uh, I forgot their name, the Mandalorian. Oh, the Mando Mercs? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. They came over, we had a bounty on Luke Cook since he was the world champion. Kyle had put a bounty on him for a core set that Doug, uh, crop aka sploosh ended up picking up and so we had the Mer- the mandalorians come over and claim the bounty on luke and take him away in handcuffs and <laughs> so you know i think that kind of sets tone for everybody the new guys to know that okay it is a tournament and there is a winner but at the same time i'm gonna have fun while i'm here because how many events or, you know, I know, uh, Kevin, yours, this was kind of your first one, but most of the events that like Evan and I have been to, it's just like exhausting. Like there's, and you want to go have fun after you've done the tournament, but you're just kind of like done. And mm-hmm. you're like, I just want to go to bed, man. You know? And, and so I think there's an opportunity there for, for the community as a whole, because it is a longer game to, to work out a way where, it can be exhilarating and fun. And also you get to hang out and spend time with people and, and compete. Yeah. All at the same time. Yeah. So y'all did a great job. Well, thanks man. We really appreciate it. Yeah, I do appreciate it. That's cool. Thank you. Um, Okay. I'm going to, this is a side note. This is I'm going to cut this. Kevin, are you comfortable with me announcing that like once a month you're going to do something or do we not want to yeah. set expectations do, do it to it follow me okay okay so back in three two one so that's going to wrap it up up for us today but what i want to say really quick is for those of you that read kevin's blog for those of you that don't you should be dummy go read it right now <laughs> uh and for those of you that do already and already love kevin uh we have a really cool little announcement here once a month Kevin's going to join us for a a select amount of time and kind of do a special little piece for us once a month on the podcast. And, uh, and it'll be maybe something he's working on, on his blog or something that he's just thinking about or something that he wants to help players with, but he's going to come on and, and have, have a little segment on our podcast. Yeah. I'm really looking forward to it. Definitely. Uh, there's like a thousand things I have that don't quite make a full blog post, but that I think I can flesh out to make some good uh, audio content. So I'm I'm honored to be joined of the family and, and pitch in every so often. Yeah, I think yeah, it's going to cool. be great. Yeah. So, all right. Well, that's that's our little... I hope you're ready for dramatic Star Wars fan fiction, because that's what's going to be. <laughs> Perfect. That's Evan. Right, that's what we agreed to, right? Evan's yeah. already doing it. <laughs> Evan's, Evan's new segment is he's writing. He's writing. Uh, we're going to have audio plays, so it's going to be amazing. That's we're yeah, gonna, so I missed the boat, Dan. <laughs> yeah, we're going to be the most unique and uh, random podcast that's ever been. I love it. I love it. <laughs> so, 
But all right, Kevin, thanks for joining us, man. Yeah, thank you, guys. I always love coming on. And everyone out there in podcast land, thanks for joining us. Everyone, stay right. Join us next week for another edition of the Fifth Trooper Podcast. This has been a Fifth Trooper production.